Uh, good morning and welcome. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, have Dr. Bob Metcalf with us today. Uh, now Bob is the inventor of Ethernet, right? So it's fair to say that in this modern world, none of us is more than a few feet away from his uh, invention. And pretty much every bit of data that you look at at any device has gone through his invention at some point in its end to end journal. Right? Usually a dozen times. A dozen times. There you go. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Bob uh, has done many different things. He, uh, you know, obviously started off in academia at MIT and Stanford, I think, and Howard, that is what I read. And then uh, was at Xerox Park, a research lab like ours here, for some time. And then I was asking him the story behind why he left Xerox and started his own company, 3Com, which is uh, 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 like one of the early pioneers in uh, network equipment stuff. I remember the uh, Bay Area Stadium was named 3Com Park at some point. It was in the, in the 90s, so it was a very dominant company back then. I think it got acquired. And then he's been in academia at UT Austin and now most recently at MIT for the past several years. He has uh, received many accolades for his work. It was a Turing Award in 2022, the IEEE Medal of Honor, the US National Medal of Technology, the Marconi Prize, and many, many other awards. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to say something. I mean, I think. Uh, you are AI here and so on, right? So I'm sure you know this. In this day and age, when you say network, people don't think of communication network. They think of the neural kind. When you say loss, they don't think of packet loss. They think of the optimization function of machine learning. But I think when someone says Ethernet, you can be sure they think of your invention. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. So many of you, I'm overwhelmed. The um, and I know you're all excited about uh, AI. So I'm gonna to try to convince you that that's the wrong thing. You need to be excited about connectivity, not, uh, not AI. Uh, but then I have a, I, I've planned a thrilling reverse conclusion at the end of my talk, which reconciles the both of them. Like that. Yeah, not AI. Um, and the reason we need to uh, focus on connectivity is that we've reached a point now where everybody's connected. There's that fact I put on the screen there. Since October of 1969, uh, 5.3 billion people have leapt onto the internet. And we've gotten so much connectivity now, we, we don't really manage it that very well. And the, and the bad news, it's gonna get worse. So we now have the megabit internet and we're about to go to the gigabit internet. So oh, here comes. By the way, would anyone like to ask a question? Yeah. Please. 1969 okay. internet. Um, isn't it in like 1902, like when Tom Berners Lee invented the internet? Or um, what? yes, there's a one of the surprises and uh, debates in networking is whether the internet started with the installation of the TCP IP protocols in 1983, or the position I'm taking here, not that it's important, was it It started before that. It started before TCP IP, and the, the protocol was called NCP. And then in 83, we went. So Vin Cerf, uh, my buddy, he invented the internet. So it's very important to him that the ARPANET, which I'm going to describe briefly, is not the internet, because he invented the internet. <laughs> It's sort of a similar situation for me. Uh, I half jokingly uh, claim to have invented Wi Fi. This really annoys the actual inventors of Wi Fi. Uh, but Wi Fi's original name was Wireless Ethernet. And I'll show you the memo where I invented it. <laughs> well, one request please use the microphone when asking questions since we're recording. So wait for the mics to be brought to you. <laughs> so I was born in 1946. And I don't know what my mother had in mind when she put a telephone in my hands. She, she must have been shaping my future career. But the cool thing about being born in 1946 is 1947, because all those things and many others, by the way, this is an abbreviated list of things, including wireless TV was invented, was ramped commercially starting in 47. But the big thing that was invented was the transistor, which has been driving all the connectivity that I'm going to be uh, talking about. Uh, now, of course, there's an old Chinese saying. <clears throat> it says that if you uh, want to get rich, you build roads first. Roads are, uh, are uh, connectivity. By the way, there's also a, a Hindi expression too. 
I have the I had the uh, Chinese expression in my talk, and I went, "Oh my goodness, I'm going to India. I can't do this." <laughs> so Chat ChatGPT four helped me find, helped me manufacture this ancient Hindi expression. Uh, the J Romans believed that connectivity was important. This is a, a map of the Roman subway system, and then. By coincidence, uh, an, uh, a tech entrepreneur in the Industrial Revolution, Blind Jack Metcalf, you see the coincidence, <laughs> he had a technology for building roads and he built the first roads in uh, England in, in preparation for the Industrial Revolution. And this was his technology, an odd combination of gravel and subsoil and so on. So roads are a form of connectivity and it's been proven over and over again that if you wanna get rich, you build roads. Now, how bad was it in the early, in the 60s? How bad was connectivity? Well, this is my mom, Ruth, says, Bobby, when you get to MIT, uh, give us a call so we know that you're safe. Let the phone ring three times and then hang up. My mother loved me, but not that much. <laughs> So the AT&T monopoly was dominant in the uh, 50s and 60s and 70s. And they introduced a new product in, oh no, don't do that, that. They introduced a new product called the Model 500. Here's a picture of the Model 500 in 1949. And uh, they discontinued that product in 1984. Uh, you'll notice how different it looks. Uh, going from 1949. So what, uh, one of our problems in the connectivity business was AT&T because they were a dominant monopoly and uh, they were moving very, very slowly evidence this. You think Steve Jobs would put, a, he, he introduced a new phone every January. This is uh, every bunch of years. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you some stories now, some of which are true about the ARPANET, the ALOANET, the ethernet, the internet, and then Wi-Fi, which I've conceded is called uh, wireless ethernet. And I, I didn't check any sources. I'm sure I plagiarized everything, uh, but this is the closed meeting. So I, it's not really plagiarism. And, uh, and I'm even gonna talk about some of the pathologies of connectivity uh, and the associated surprises. Now the beware, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. My hammer is connectivity. So I tend to overdo that. But, uh, and then there's a definition of connectivity for those of you who need it. Connectivity is apparatus for moving stuff from point A to point B. That stuff could be mass, could be energy, or in our case, it's signals being transported from A to B. And then the first sort of math science approach to connectivity uh, came from Claude Shannon, and this was his this was his model of, uh, of connectivity, a very simple model with one channel. Um, this is a picture of, of uh, Shannon generated by uh, CPT4. And uh, I don't know what this line is. Look at this line here. What is, I don't know what that is. But anyway, that's allegedly what he looked like and that's his math in the background. And the point I'm making here is he looked at the, capacity of a single channel, but there's all these other topics associated with connectivity. Connectivity is not just the Shannon model, it's all these other things too that you have to be good at uh, to connect things. So when I entered the connectivity business, this was how computing was done. We had decks, but they weren't startup decks, they were card decks containing our programs and data. So you would punch cards on this, card punch, and you would feed them in your deck into the feed reader, into the uh, card reader. By the way, I'm jet lagged, so I say things like feed reader when I meant card reader, so be careful. With it. Anyway, there's the card reader that would read your deck in here, and then here's the printer that would print out all your error messages the next morning. So if you submitted by four, you got your answers the next morning, and they were usually error messages. And this was the computing world in the 70s, when uh, in the 60s, when the internet got started. But a revolution had uh, a revolution had started, and that was the move toward interactive time sharing. 
So, so we were the, the movement to eliminate punch cards and replace it with interactive uh, terminals. So we, we thought you should use uh, the ASR teletype with a paper. And then these are two PDP-10s, mini computers. Each one would have about 64 of these dumb terminals. And th these were the computers that the internet was aiming to connect. Because a guy named Bob Taylor at ARPA had three terminals just like that in his office connected to the three ARPA sites he was funding. And he wondered, why do I need three identical terminals to talk to my three sponsored sites? Why don't we have a network that allows me to take one terminal and move it around? And that was called resource sharing. And I built, so I got into the business because we needed to connect our PDP-10s to the switching structure of the internet. And this was my debut was this, I'm sorry, I'm not used to this yet, here we go. I built this out of MSI, chips and this was at MIT uh, and then um, it was so this packet switch that brought the internet into your building was like a refrigerator and then you needed to connect your computer to that refrigerator and that's what that device did um, and and so resource sharing was the killer app of the yes so the uh, you know in 1969 they had these four imps right at four different sites what was their connectivity like so how, how are, because that was also for yeah, so, share, right? so each ARPA site got a refrigerator, an I amp, see. an amp, okay. and it had, roughly speaking, eight ports, four host ports, and four modem ports. So mine, I got, I got number six, imp number six in the northeast corner of 545 Tech Square, and it it had uh, two modems coming in from AT and T at the transcontinental links carrying all the traffic of the internet ran at 50 kilobits per second and we had two of those one going to sri uh, to bbn and the other one going to harvard maybe but then we had four host ports so mit was one of the few places that had four computers so we uh, i got one of the ports and i put a pdp 10 on it there were two more pdp 10s and the multix operating system also was the Multics operating system was put on by my first Indian friend, Abhay Bhushan. So he and I hung out for a whole year and he was doing, we were doing the same thing, only he was doing it for a, uh, the uh, big computer and I was doing it for the smaller PDP-10. So I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So 50 kilobit circuits. Uh, so resource sharing, and I've told you that was Bob Taylor's, first, may he rest in peace, frustration at needing three terminals. We only need one terminal, but he needed to be able to switch it. And uh, and so bullet item two here, don't do that, do that. Uh, <laughs> Professor Leonard Kleinrock at UCLA had a student named Charlie Klein and they, they did their software. The protocol was called Telnet. The first protocol of the internet was called Telnet. So they had a Telnet and they decided to try it. So to log in, from a dumb terminal at UCLA into a uh, PDP-10 up at SRI, I think it was. And the grad student, they wanted to log in, so the grad student typed L, and the L got echoed. And then he typed O, and the O got echoed. And then he typed G, and the computers all crashed. But UCLA has been taking credit ever since then for having been the first messages on the internet. They eventually got it working, so in fairness to them. But again, this was remote login of dumb terminals. And so what we, what we noticed was when we go to, over to that other computer that we're going to run our app on, our data was still here. And we needed our data to be over there. So let's invent another protocol. Let's call it FTP, file transfer protocol. Ah, OK. So we designed FTP. And then we noticed that you could put stuff in the files that were being transferred. You could put names and addresses in it. So the files being transferred became emails. And in the very instant that they became emails, resource sharing went away. And, and the new killer app, and you could even argue to this day, the killer app is email. And, and ARPA was not anticipating this. They were into resource sharing and instead they got, uh, they got email. Instantly, in the, this little networking world, I got moderately famous, not for building that piece of hardware, which is 
hard for me, but straightforward. It was inventing the, the, uh, uh, this group of us, inventing the Telnet protocol. And more importantly, I held a workshop at MIT for everyone to bring their Telnet implementations and test them. In a, so we had a N by N matrix and we tested. And every time we found a bug, we would fix it. And it happened one weekend. We debugged Telnet in one weekend. And that approach, the idea of testing interoperability was adopted by the internet community. And is a source of, it was a source of its strength, is a source of its strength. So not certification, interoperability is uh, the internet model. So this is the internet in 1973. I call it the kilobit internet because of the aforementioned 50 kilobit circuits. I have to point out to my colleagues at the University of Texas that you'll notice this link goes through Texas, but it doesn't stop there. It just goes right through to coast to coast. And this is the, this is the MIT, imp. that's the PDP-10 that I put on that imp, and then I moved to Xerox Research and I did it again. I built equivalent hardware to connect Xerox. Any questions? So I'm the luckiest guy in the world, electrical engineer working at Xerox. And they said, we need someone to build a network to connect a personal computer on every desk. And no one had ever had that problem before. So I had, that was a huge opportunity and out of it came ethernet. And, but there was immediate competition for Ethernet while we were building, while Dave Boggs made rest in peace and my colleague, while we were building that first Ethernet, there was competition inside of Xerox as we built it out. The, the fiercest, uh, yeah, let me move on to that. So we started with dumb terminals in the transition as we were making progress, 1970, 71, 72. The paper got replaced by glass. This was called a glass teletype, but still a dumb terminal. And then we developed a personal computer at Xerox Research called Alto, and this is a picture of it. So the, the, the dominant uh, attached item on the internet made this transition from paper to glass to PC. And there's a picture of lonely me. This is the state of the art dumb terminal, 30 characters per second, 300 baud. You all know what a baud is? You said, yeah, but they didn't nod their heads. <laughs> I told you the age. So. <laughs> yeah, 300 baud, three, uh, basically 300 bits per second. And uh, that was my terminal. Up there, that is a box of 35 millimeter slides. So I was on the board of the company that developed PowerPoint and we sold it to Microsoft in 1987 for $14 million. But this is 1973. So PowerPoint is way in the future. So what we had was everybody had boxes of 35 million. Anyone who gave presentations had boxes of, this is a, there's a carousel inside of this box. And this over here is a, that's an actual Rolodex. And this is that telephone uh, that you saw earlier. And these are pencils. And this is an IBM typewriter. So the memo inventing ethernet was typed on a uh, IBM typewriter looking much like this one here. So that was the environment. And so it, uh, I typed the memo on May 22nd, 1973. The, the grand scheme was this, a shared coaxial cable. Anybody wishing to send a packet just would insert that packet onto this shared coax, and then it would be received off that coax by the uh, addressed packet. So it was a packet exchange across a shared coaxial cable. And uh, so here's the Alto, is the name of the personal computer that we built at Xerox. And so this, there was an Alto on every desk and they would attach to uh, part of the shared. This diagram actually shows the coax branching, but no one ever did that. It was, it was typically just one uh, cable. Here you see there's branching here, but there, no one ever did that. And, uh, and this is the memo in which it was named Ethernet. And you'll notice it, uh, we called it Ethernet because we, we, didn't, we chose coax as the initial medium, but we didn't think that that decision was important. So we didn't call it coax net. 
we wanted to call it something that was applicable to other media, like optical fibers, cop copper wire, and radio. We really wanted radio. So over here, you'll notice that we could carry our packets. We, we made our own internet protocol called POP, uh, which was replaced by TCP IP later. So you could use the telephone network to carry packets between campuses. And oh, look at that radio ether. That's an ethernet using, could that be Wi-Fi in 1973? I don't know. But the, uh, we wanted ethernet to be wired. I'm sorry. I have a question. Were you inspired by the wireless thing, the Aloha net? Yes, I was about to say that. Okay. So we were looking, we were, as we were building this system, choosing coax and so on, we needed a way for the terminals to take turns. How do they get, there's this shared cable and how do they take turns? And I ran across a paper uh, by Norm Abramson, the University of Hawaii, 1970, the National Computer Conference. And he analyzed, he had a model of a, a randomized retransmission method. So you send your packet onto, into the medium. If it goes through, you'll get an acknowledgement. That's great. If it doesn't go through, you choose a random number and you count it down and then you send it again. And the reason for choosing the random number is to avoid repeated collisions. So two packets would collide and then they would randomize and then they would come into the channel staggered and so they wouldn't repeat. And uh, so I went to the University of Hawaii, I spent a month at the University of Hawaii palling around with uh, Norm Abramson, may he rest in peace, and uh, discovered several things. One is we couldn't possibly use radio. The radio modems were this big, like this. And the personal computer we were gonna network was about this big. So uh, our allocation was a 60 chip card, not a box. So we couldn't be radio. And we wanted as few channels as possible. So we built a one, ra a one radio, a one channel system. Uh, the other difference was the uh, Aloha network was a wide area network and it ran at say 10 kilobits per second, something like that. And, uh, but Ethernet was a local area network and we planned to run at 2.94 megabits per second, which I'll save you the math, is 10,000 times faster. And a consequence of that uh, higher speed and the fact that you had a cable meant you could add some features. This led to trouble later, let's see. Yeah, these features down here, we, Aloha Network did not have carrier sense, did not have collision detection, and did not have back off. Those were added on because we could, because we had this coax connection. We weren't relying on uh, radios. So this was uh, the Park Ethernet, and it filled. We filled Xerox with it, and we filled Xerox with personal computers, the Alto personal computers, starting in 1973. Any questions? Yes, sir. I'm asking you to imagine not having desktop personal computers. I'm, try to imagine, you can't. <laughs> and I, but I can, I can remember when there was no PC on my desk. And, uh, anyway, yes, sir. Yeah, my question, you mentioned there were competing teams in Xerox, which were looking at it. What, how did they, I mean, what did they do? And were there other teams outside Xerox looking at it or? Yeah, here it is. So we're so my friend Dave and I we're building this Ethernet thing, and it was controversial. And uh, the principal competition is, and networking guys are familiar with this sneaker net, which means people say, "I, I don't need a network. The printer's there, the disk drive's here. Take the diskette, put on my sneakers, walk down to the printer, and print." And we had this page for second laser printer. And people, some people said, we don't need a network. And that, by the way, it cost $1,000. And it's funny money, research money. But still, they had to check a box. And it cost them $1,000. So a bunch of them said, no, no, we don't need We, we have sneaker net. Uh, and very quickly, uh, they learned, we, we had invented command P, or control P. Well, what's the command here? Control P. We invented control P. So you're looking at the... Well, we also invented Microsoft Word. And so you have a word, it was called Bravo, and you would you would see it on the screen and you hit Control P and it would be printed out on the printer down the hall. Uh, 
there was a, a pre a pre existing network commercially available from Data General called the MCA, and it was 16 bit parallel. Not appropriate for running around a building. I mean, a cable this thick with a huge, ugly connector on it. And uh, Signet was interesting. This is short for Simone's Infinitely Glorious Network. This is Charles Simone. He works here, not here, here, but here, yeah. And he, he got there before me and he was working on a 250 megabit per second network called Signet. And uh, when I arrived, the management, so not that there was much, uh, said, Charles, we'd like you to stop working on the network and go do this text editor thing. And Bob, you, why don't you do the networking thing? So I got the raw end of that deal. Uh, Charles uh, wrote word here. And then we had a, uh, uh, a guy, I don't want to name him, but let's see, did he work at Microsoft? I think he did. He's gone now, but he and I hated each other. And uh, Ethernet didn't go, the building and design of Ethernet did not go smoothly. So during one of our awkward periods, he saw his chance to knock us out of the competition. And he came up with a network called XNet, which was 16-bit parallel. It was a bad idea. So I went to Bob Taylor, the head of the lab, and said, Bob, that's a bad idea. And not only that, it's going to kill my idea because this person was quite important and had all the resources of the lab at his disposal. So I was afraid of having all the ox oxygen sucked out of the room. And Bob Taylor denied it to, up to his death. Uh, he denied intervening, but my adversary dropped XNet wisely. I guess, he, I guess we convinced him it was a bad idea. Um, so there was some internal connect uh, competition, but finally we got it done. And one of our constraints, a lot of constraints, so maybe I should enumerate them later. Uh, we needed to be done in 1973 because this PC was going to start being deployed in 1973 and it needed a network and the laser printer needed a network. So a constraint was you got to finish it. You can't optimize it forever. Um, so then uh, we filled Xerox with these PCs and connected them with ethernets and gave them all laser printers. And in 1979, I left Xerox to, to start my own company, 3Com Corporation, Computer Communication Compatibility based on standards. And uh, I ran into a guy, a guy named Steve from a company named Apple in a city called Cupertino. And I had not heard of any of those three things, not even Cupertino. And uh, uh, we talked about my joining Apple as a networking guy, but instead I told him I just started my company. So, uh, and I tried to sell him a network and I called it Orchard. That was, that was my idea of networking, you know, of marketing is to call it Orchard. Steve spent one nanosecond on that proposal and moved back to his principal method, which was recruiting instead. But it, when he heard that I was determined to have a company, he convinced me that I needed to buy an Apple II and I needed to run a piece of software that he really liked called VisiCalc and said, when you do your business plan, use the Apple II and VisiCalc to do your spreadsheet. And I did, and I raised a million bucks with it. And then that, this is a picture of the plan and there's the output of the, the VisiCalc and it was done on an Apple II. And so I ended up with the standard Silicon Valley con configuration there's the inventor type person, that's me. There's the investor type people, of which I had several, and the adult supervision, this is Bill. So Bill knew how to run things. We recruited him to run things. Uh, a lot of people think Steve Jobs was a great CEO. And he was, ultimately, but not at the beginning. He founded Apple in 76, he became CEO in 96. And he had a series of adult supervisions uh, as, as the company grew. And we lucked out because in 1982, IBM started shipping this computer, the IBM personal computer. And uh, so it was announced and shipped in August of 81. And we shipped an ethernet card for the IBM PC in 1982. And it, pretty soon we were shipping a million of them a month after a couple of years. And we went public in 1984 on the basis of that product. And here's what we learned about ethernet while we, at, in the commercial world, over time, 
If you look at Ethernet today, the various Ethernets today, the journal tap is gone. No one likes to tap coax. We're not sharing coax anymore. We have, we have hubs. Uh, Manchester encoding is gone. It's, it's a beautiful encoding, but it's very inefficient too. Two baud per bit. And, and the Aloha network carrier sense, uh, uh, I'm sorry, randomized retransmissions have gone away because there's no more collisions and because of, there's no more shared coax. So the three, that initial ethernet was a Gerald Manchester Aloha ethernet, but today those are gone. And here are the enduring contributions. There are probably a few more, but ethernet brought internet packets to the desktop. They, did, they used to stop at the host, this big computer in the center, and then you would talk on a dumb terminal to the host and get access to the application that was dealing with it. Ethernet brought those packets all the way to the desktop so you could write code at the desk that ran on the network raw. It, Ethernet established the abundance of bandwidth. I mentioned this earlier, but the bandwidth went from 10 kilobits to three megabits. That's a factor of 10,000 times. Let me say that again, 10,000 times, not 10%, not 100%, 10,000 times, which made it practical to upload cat pictures. <laughs> so the abundance, bandwidth abundance became more the rule after ethernet. Yes. So I think there's a question I it's, uh, asked you in email as well. So when we talk about ethernet today, what is ethernet about it? Because as you said, a lot of the fundamentals have changed. Is it the model of computing and communication that the original Ethernet enabled and that endures, uh, but the technology is completely changed because it you know switched and, and, and all those things, or like are, are the elements of the original technical design of the Ethernet that have endured as well? So Ethernet is a brand, and a brand is a promise, and I'm the brand manager. It used to be a Xerox trademark, but they, they in order to make Ethernet a standard, they uh, gave up their patent. Uh, but so I have a self-appointed brand manager of the word Ethernet, and it means the several things you touched on. Uh, I think it's a model. And the leading term in the model is it's uh, internet native. It's uh, uh, build it and they will come. It's faster than you need. It's backward compatible. Oh, it's a standard, uh, a de jure standard. It's backward compatible with the install base. And it's uh, and it's interoperable with uh, multi-vendor interoperability. That's a beginning list. So I claim Ethernet means that model. And if your product matches that list, then I begin to think of it as an Ethernet thing. Uh, so now automotive Ethernet is taking off now. So I'm I'm watching carefully to be sure they don't vary from this list because uh, it's going to be quite important. Other questions on the oh, and there's an Ethernet packet format which is in your cell phone. I mean, there it's everywhere. So some people think it's the packet format that was the enduring, that ethernet means a packet format. And I think that's too narrow. And so I choose the model. Uh, and then there are some people who say CSMA, CD, that original, that this is what ethernet means. And this is something else. And I don't pay any attention to those people. Uh, so imagine the difficulty of building a network to connect all these things when the thing you're connecting changes. So we started with punch cards and now we have thermostats and the iPhones. So there's the evolution of this, of uh, the, the platforms that needed to be networked changed uh, over this time. And then the traffic being carried changed. The internet was not built to carry video or to be mobile. Now it's only a video and mobile. I forget what the, oh yeah, the percentages are right there. So the, uh, so the, the use of the ethernet and the internet evolved over time. And this evolution is pretty dramatic because people thought that the, the latency or the retransmissions or something about ethernet would prevent it from carrying video. And mobile hadn't been anticipated. We, we imagined a sun workstation sitting squarely on your desk. And we didn't imagine that you would be carrying it around with you. So that shows you a, a rapid evolution of the traffic being carried. And then there were the, in, the disruptions, which are many. Uh, advertising, publishing, journalism, commerce, telecoms, TV, dating, toll booths, retail, 
uh, uh, slide presentations. These are all impacts of the connectivity. Dis they call them disruptions, but they're generally positive steps forward. So I, I use, I put the word disruption in quotes to signal that I, I think a disruption is a positive thing. And now the big disruptions are now starting. These are little uh, on a revenue basis, say. The big ones are coming, the nature of work, education, health, energy, and these are big compared to those little things up there. And, and those disruptions are playing out now. We have a building, it's the Google building in downtown Austin, which I pass every day, it is empty. And it's, it just got finished, it's beautiful. Uh, and it's right on the lake, it's right downtown. So you can't go through Austin without seeing this building and it's empty. So how is that gonna play out? How, uh, how much real estate do we really need? How often do you need to have personal touch with people? And that's been impacted by, by the internet. Uh, I'm, uh, in a minute, I'm gonna talk about some of the pathologies, the bad things of connectivity, but here's the good thing. And, and there's lots of variations of this, but this is my favorite. So this is a plot of the people who are super poor and you see it grows along with the overall population until after 1950, uh, it starts accelerating upward. And, and in 1969, the internet arrives and that would put it right about here. And then notice uh, poverty is still growing. But a few years later, after the World Wide Web arrives for the first time in the history of the world, uh, extreme poverty goes down. And I claim that it's because of the connectivity of the internet. That's true. And yes, I know the difference between correlation and causality, but I think uh, correlation is a first step toward causality. I take it as a good sign. So I claim the internet is reducing frictions of commerce and otherwise encouraging uh, economic activity so that poverty is being fought and this is the big the big plus so here are some of the negatives so i claim that the connectivity coming from the internet came quickly like is, since 69 5.3 billion people got on it in my book that's fast so fast that we didn't really know how to handle it it came faster than our ability to uh, manage it and the first the first uh, pathology was hacking in christmas of 73 to Los Angeles high school students got somebody's root password and broke into the ARPANET. That was, I wrote a memo documenting that event. So we've been fighting hackers since the very beginning. And the reason we had a problem there is because the internet was built by grad students who had no notion of everybody's a good person. There's no need to have, you know, passwords and stuff like that. And we learned quickly. And then there was pornography, which hit and the United States government almost shut down the internet because it was so good for, at carrying porno. But then a law was passed called the Communications Decency Act of 1995 or so. And uh, that act was passed and then a year later was found to be unconstitutional. But in any case, there's no more pornographic, pornographic material on the internet. And then there's uh, advertising. And advertising is a strange case because it was a pathology you know, us computer programmers and hardware designers were offended that after all that work, they're putting this commercial crap on our network, advertising things. And we were getting on our high horse about getting advertising eliminated when along came the recognition that advertising would fund the entire growth and operation of the internet. So that pathology flipped from, uh, the, I guess the residual is spam, but even spam, we don't talk, When's the last time you've had a conversation about spam? Well, it's still there, but we've sort of handled it. And I, my claim is we're gonna handle these pathologies. The new pathologies um, are right here, like polarization, loneliness. There's no joke, this is no joking matter. Uh, censorship, fake news, and then, uh, um, and so on. So, and my claim is I'm the optimist that we're gonna fight those um, pathologies the way we fought the previous one and, and succeed. Uh, this is the first internet ad 
placed by AT&T in 1994. And presumably the image quality has improved since then. See, that's what video looked like when it was carried on the old internet and all the ethernet cables have gotten a hundred times faster so that we've gone to higher resolution. Okay, another set of surprises comes from, these are big surprises, so I call them reversals. And the, the first one of note is Grosch's law. Now, Grosch was an IBM executive who in, whose law was that the, the, the cost of a mainframe computer went up as the square root of its, I'm sorry, it, its cost went up as the square root of its power. And I may have said that wrong. Um, but the consequence of that law, Grosch's law, is that bigger computers are better. And so the East Coast of the United States which in the 70s was Silicon Valley. Route 128 was where all the innovation was going on. And Silicon Valley didn't exist yet. Uh, Boston bought into Grosch's Law, including MIT, my alma mater. And by doing that, Silicon Valley went to Palo Alto, where there was another guy named Gordon Moore who was producing chips and saying, in essence, Smaller computers are better, and it's good to network them together. So that was a, that was a reversal. Then Nicholas Negroponte, a MIT professor, he's uh, he's famous for many things. The switch. After a while, as we were as the internet was spreading, we began to think that the local traffic inside the building would be carried by the old copper that was put there by AT and T over a hundred years, and the long haul would be carried wirelessly using microwave, either terrestrial or satellite. And Negroponte noticed that something different was happening. There was a switch happening. And we weren't using the copper inside the building. We were using Wi-Fi, which is the opposite. That's wireless. And the wireless long haul went away too because we started using optical fibers. Satellites did not prove uh, to, to be, uh, the latencies were too high. By the way, I just got my Starlink. And so that there might be another switch in the works. I don't know how that's going to go, but my Starlink works great. And that's a satellite, but it's not an earth orbiting satellite. It's a low satellite. And so the, the latency is um, not the problem. And then there's the, the, the big reversal. Marconi got his Nobel prize for getting radio. The guy invented radio, <laughs> get radio to go further and further over the, over the hill in his, villa in uh, Italy, and then across the Atlantic and around the world. So his whole life was about getting ready to go to go further. But what Marty Cooper, the inventor of the mo uh, mobile phone has, I'm going to show you that graph in a minute. Uh, ever since Marconi, progress in radio has been getting it to go shorter distances, not longer distances. So the cell sizes of, of G, one, two, three, four, five, six, are getting smaller and smaller and smaller for frequency use and power conservation, which, uh, which is an interesting reversal. Any questions? This? By the way, here's a picture of their, they're tearing down the, the Boston sign and, the, and then this is the Silicon Valley sign. Over here. And there's my company right, right there. And uh, there's Apple over here. Notice Apple's about the same size as my company. And, and, Um, so in 1982, I was out selling Ethernet cards for IBM PCs, and it was difficult selling because there weren't any IBM PCs to speak of. Um, but we made a, a, a trial kit, three cards, three Ethernet cards, a length of cable with associated connectors, and a, a diskette with software on it. And we sold it for $3,000, and it allowed you to take three IBM PCs, put a card in each one and then run a cable among them and then load the software in. And then you could share a printer, you could share a disk and you could exchange emails among the three terminals. And it worked. And our customers said, you know, it works. It's just not useful. <laughs> and I was head of sales and marketing at that time. And that became my problem. My, our customers think our products are not useful. What, what's going on there? So I went to Stanford one night where there were a bunch of Altos, which we had donated, Xerox had donated to Stanford. And I made this slide. 
uh, and uh, made a uh, made six 35 millimeter slides and hand put them into the carousels of my sales force and sent them out into the world to tell customers that the cost of their network grew linearly. But the value of their network, the number of possible connections, which is what I said was the value, goes as the square. So there's a critical mass point out here. You have to reach that. Your networks are not big enough. And what's the remedy for that? Buy more of our products. <laughs> and they did. And, uh, and it worked out. And we went public a few months later. Uh, so the question arises, was I lying when I told people this? Was I, was I lying? And the answer is no, because I had, I had a time machine. I worked at the Xerox Research Center for eight years, and that was my time machine. So I knew what the internet looked like because we built one inside of Xerox. So we were just building it again outside, and we knew that it was valuable and that people would like it. So I was not lying for the record. Questions? Uh, oh, by the way, this is Gordon Moore on the left. May he rest in peace, explaining to me how Moore's law is somewhat more rigorous than Metcalf's law. I think he said numerically accurate since 1965. Uh, and this is uh, uh, Marty Cooper, inventor of the cell phone, this is his graph going back to 1900. So he he enjoys upstaging Gordon Moore because his his law is more impressive than Gordon Moore's is. Uh, and so the uh, the spectral efficiency has been going up at an astronomical rate since Marconi. So connectivity, by the way, is not only the internet. And this is one of my favorite, not internet. Uh, there's these two space vehicles, perhaps you've heard of them. Uh, they're called the Voyager, Voyager 1 and 2, and each one has a radio in it. And those radios, now those vehicles are more than 20 billion kilometers away from here. And they each have a radio, and those radios are broadcasting data from interstellar space at 160 bits per second using Manchester encoding in the... Uh, and then another kind of connectivity, my favorite, this is the neuron transistor connectivity paradox. Transistors are what, five nanometers now, and they run at three gigahertz. Uh, and they're tiny little things. And neurons are a thousand times bigger and a million times uh, slower than transistors. And yet, the things that we can build with neurons are much more, are smarter than the things we can build with transistors. Why is that? Why do neurons outperform transistors in the construction of AGI and moving toward AGI? And the answer is the subject of this talk, connectivity. So, uh, so I've spoken to the open AI people who are, uh, Oh, they're your people. <laughs> and uh, so I've run this by uh, people. And I noticed that the chat GPT-4, oh, and since you know all these answers, now I'm about to learn uh, 176 billion connections in chat GPT-4. 176 billion. What's that? You're talking about GPT-3. I think GPT-4 is possibly larger, right? No. No. But then there's the question of the next one. And so there are rumors that it's 100 trillion connections. The connections being, they call them parameters, and they're analogous to synapses in the brain, and they're connections among the neurons. And 100 trillion is the rumored, I won't ask you to confirm or deny it, uh, step. And so I'd like to point out that that sounds like a really big number, but it's not. The human brain has 10 to the 11th neurons, each of which has on average 10 to the fourth uh, synapses. So that's 10 to the 15th, whereas 100 trillion is, only, is much less than that. But you can do that in your head. So I've done the arithmetic. 
the the number of parameters or connections in the next model have to be 5,700 times what they are today in order to uh, operate at the AGI level. Now, whether I asked the uh, OpenAI people whether we would get AGI at that point, and he said, what's his name? Greg or Charles, the president, not. What? Yes. And he said, we'll see. <laughs> so eventually we're going to see whether AGI results. Now this is a connectivity. This is all other things being equal and focusing in on the connectivity and assuming that the role of the neuron is, is uh, secondary to the role of the connections, which is what I'm trying to convince you of. Uh, an interesting fact is that I was a MIT uh, graduate in 1968 and my thesis advisor was Marvin Minsky. And my thesis, my thesis title was a neuron model and some of its information processing capabilities. Fortunately, all copies of that dissertation have been lost. <laughs> and I, I don't know what, what could I have possibly written in that? It was an undergraduate thesis, by the way. So, and uh, so, so I've been watching AI go like this since 1968. And a short form of the explanation is a new wave like expert systems will come along and it'll prosper for a while and then it will run out of data and die. And this has happened three or four times since 1968, but I don't think it's gonna happen this time because we have the internet now, we have connectivity now. And so I'm, I'm on the optimistic side that, uh, by the way, if, if AI is killed, and when I say killed, I mean, it stops being so important. Uh, uh, I forgot what I was gonna say. Ah, so I keep asking, model collapse. Have you heard that term? Is anyone? That, it's a term that's I've run into several times, and I'm not an AI expert, but I have heard this term, model collapse. And what that means is you're, you're scraping, and then you scrape again, scrape or crawl, whatever it is, extracting the, the model. But each time you do it, you get less and less useful information. You, eventually you extract all of the knowledge that's actually in the data, and that's called, uh, these people who are talking about this call that model collapse when you, and the, uh, the worst form of it is when you take the output of your model and feed it back in and, and that accelerates model collapse. So if, if uh, uh, AI is going to be dampened, it will be because uh, my current theory is some sort of, some form of model collapse where the amount of data being extracted, uh, it just gets old, it's just been extracted before. This, by the way, is one of the diagrams that misleads people. You'll notice it makes the neuron and the transistor the same size, for example. And we know there's a factor of a thousand there. And then the number of axons is, you know, there's like nine here, uh, but the real number is 10,000. So be careful of that diagram. It misleads you into the, the role of connectivity. Okay, the, so now, Speaking of connectivity, COVID arrived in 2019, which happened to be the 50th anniversary of the internet. So I, I'm, and, and the internet was there. I'm sorry, I should modify this. This says Teams. <laughs> teams saved the day. And so now all these people who for years and years and years were telling me, I will never use video to teach my class because Video doesn't allow, doesn't allow me to hug my students and look them in the eye and so on. And these are mostly, uh, these are professors at all the universities you've ever met. They all had that attitude, including Texas where I hang out. And uh, COVID came along and suddenly every course at the University of Texas was being taught on video, on Zoom actually. And suddenly people got a taste of it. So, and that's playing out. It's part of that work learning uh, disruption that I talked about earlier. And so I'm proposing that we change the meaning of the acronym COVID. It, it, it actually is short for collaborative video. 
And with that dramatic ending, I'll repeat that the most important new fact about the human condition is that we are now all suddenly connected. Thank you for your attention. I hope there's some questions. I have a few minutes for questions, so raise your hand and break the microphone. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. So, as you know, um, AI has been growing exponentially. How do you see connectivity change for AI in particular? Well, there is the connectivity of the neural nets itself, and then there's the connectivity at a higher level. So I, I, I got to <laughs> Jensen Wang of NVIDIA called me to interview me. Of course, he didn't realize that I was going to interview him. Uh, he didn't know that was my job was to be an interviewer. So I interviewed J uh, Jensen and I got him and he was reluctant in a funny way for such a successful person. And the reason is his company had just gone through a, a network evaluation and didn't choose Ethernet. They chose the other one. I forget what it is, but it's another fast network specializing in short distance stuff. And, uh, and, and so Jensen's talking to the inventor of Ethernet. So he's a little sheepish about talking to me. And, and I said, don't worry, Ethernet will take over. He says, there's no need for you to you know, be sheepish, here it comes. So there's, a, there's the, the net, the neural net has that neural net connectivity here, but it also has the enterprise connectivity and other forms right here. Uh, and some of that will be uh, Ethernet. Some of it will be automotive Ethernet, which is catching on. The cyber truck runs on Ethernet. So it makes me want to go buy one just to you know, support Elon. Other questions? Uh, you didn't mention one three letter word called ATM, which at one point was supposedly going to dethrone Ethernet. But it was, and it's one of my, another one of my uh, failures in life. For a while, I was promoting ATM. Uh, I was going through an awkward phase. <laughs> and I, then eventually I noticed that dividing everything into 53 byte pieces was not nowhere near optimal. And ATM was being promoted by the existing monopolies and we didn't like them. So whatever they said, even if they promoted Ethernet, we would hate it if it came from, from the telephone companies, which is where ATM was coming from. But eventually uh, we figured out ATM was not uh, appropriate. It was taking an old, the need for uh, carrying voice at, uh, you know, 14.4 kilobits per second was not what the network needed. That was the, that was a holdover from the telephone. You know? So ATM. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Ram, there used to be at the telephone company, at and So <laughs> at one point, yeah, yeah. at at and well, Almost that's... everybody had. I have a question. So, you know, uh, how much of the success of Ethernet is something that you could have anticipated and how much of it was circumstances, right? You know, basically once the one technology becomes dominant, the cost of components drops and it becomes harder and harder for any competing technology, even if it's superior to actually win because, you know, you can't match the scale of the winner, right? So how much of it was by design and how much of it was you think was sort of chance? Well, and a point I failed to make is that uh, so far is that the, these stories and many other related stories uh, are useful to know about because they sort of inform us about the, pay, the rate of change in innovation. How does innovation happen? And, uh, and timing is very important. So your question is a timing question because it's uh, when we were doing ethernet inside of Xerox, the notion of an industry standard, that it was just inside of Xerox. But then when we got into the outside world, we tried to have a meeting. I organized a meeting of Digital Equipment Corporation, Intel Corporation, and Xerox Corporation to standardize Ethernet. No, I'm, I'm sorry, to use Ethernet to interconnect their products. The lawyers descended on us and said, you can't meet. You have an antitrust problem. Three, the three companies are not allowed to be in the same room unsupervised. So I called my fraternity brother, who happened to be an expert on antitrust, and he gave me a list of the five things, I forget, that you need to do to avoid antitrust. So I called up the lawyers of DEC, Intel, and Xerox and said, at our meeting, we're gonna have no marketing people. We're not gonna discuss prices. 
uh, and we're and our goal is to make an open industry standard. So it was in that moment, it was a marketing strategy to go around um, antitrust. Uh, it also had other benefits. Customers loved it. They they liked the idea of a multi vendor standard because then they could pit the vendors against each other, uh, and so it flew. So that was a surprise, the fact that we had to we had to uh, standardize. So we created. IEEE 802 committee to standardize networks, and it did. It not only did Ethernet; it did, it did wireless Ethernet a little bit later. Is that? Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, sir. Um, you talk a lot about like inflection points in your talk about like certain points at which like the internet was invented, and that changed a lot of things. So, like having lived through those points of time, did you see anything at that time which like any signs in terms of this is going to be the future, or was it just uh, one day it wasn't there, and one day you woke up and it suddenly was a big thing? No. Um, uh, I uh, this whole talk has been to try to convince you that there are lots of surprises, reversals, pathologies, lots of surprises in networking. So when you're asked to predict the future. One thing you can predict, there can be some surprises out there, but what they are, that's the hard part. Is the, the current priority among networking people is latency. So you have Elon launching satellites at low Earth orbiting satellites that have low latency. You have the, the gaming people need low latency on the networks. Wall Street wants low latency in their trading. So latency, so I claim one of those surprises is gonna be latency related. Someone's gonna figure out latency at some point. Uh, so, uh, what's it called? What are we up to? Five or six? I guess we're up to five. Is the the new uh, mobile standard, and it's focused on improving uh, latency. What is it called? Five G. Yeah, excuse me. At Texas, we're working on six G already, but five uh, G. Yeah, but they're focused on latency, so that would be one possible uh, example. Hmm. Sorry, I don't have a better answer. We can take one more question. Any questions online? I mean, I guess from the COVID people, the collaborative video people. <laughs> Any questions online? If not, we'll take a question from the... Okay, Hamid, okay, Tanuja, please go ahead. So, Prime Day, thank you for the talk. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, networking has had immense impact over the decades across the world. But uh, when you were kind of working on this particular problem, um, had you anticipated that it can have enormous kind of impact and especially to young researchers and innovators like us. Do you have any advice on while choosing the problem? Did you use any methodology on long term, looking at long term and how to choose the problem, how to sustain on the problem that would have long term impact? An approximate answer to your question is no. <laughs> that is, I attended every computer conference that you could imagine for my whole life. I've been to every one of them. And it accounts for my age. And I stooped over from sitting in. And every one of those conferences had a session on the ethics or the societal impacts. Or there's always a session on that. But nobody ever went to those <laughs> sessions. So that's why I say no. It wasn't a lot of anticipation of the, the new pathologies that I've listed here. So my goodness, have you seen those fakes that are floating around now? I don't think anyone knows what to do with that. Um, and I don't ever remember one of the little little sessions at a conference being about what are you going to do about fakes? That's a new problem. Um, so I guess we did, I'm sure we didn't spend enough time thinking about those higher level. Now I'm a plumber, it's not my fault. I just carried the bits around. It's the people above me made all the mistakes, and they're the ones who create the fakes. And so no, I just carry bits around. So, so should Ethernet have a packet filter in it? So we would say no. We tried to put as little as possible in Ethernet so that the higher level protocols would, would take care of it. Um, I've always wanted to put a little uh, a Bitcoin machine in every Ethernet. So every time a packet went through, it would send me a Bitcoin. But I haven't figured out how to do that yet. So at the moment, we don't uh, steal money using our Ethernets. 
some people think that I can actually turn off the internet because you know I, I obviously all those ethernets listen to me all the time and no. <laughs> How's that? You have a it's a Do hard you have question. any advice for young researchers on choosing the problems? Say again. Advice, any advice for young people choosing new problems to work on? Connectivity. <laughs> and this isn't the slide, but oh, by the way, you can have these slides there. Remember, I listed all the other other than Shannon's theorem, the other things that have to be uh, taken on. So there's rich territory there for uh, for what do you call them, young people? Uh, um, I chose networking because I walked into an office at Harvard University with a, a brand new pair of bachelor's degrees. And I said, who's sponsoring stuff? And the answer was ARPA is sponsoring this networking stuff. So that's how I chose networking. And, uh, and it worked out, it was a good choice, but you know, half of it was, was luck. But if you're a grad student, uh, entering grad student, find out what's sponsored. <laughs> On that note, uh, let's thank Bob again. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, the, your talk uh, you know, started from before. Pretty much everyone in this room was born, except maybe that guy at the end. Not you. So uh, really uh, informative and entertaining. Thank you. I got a question yesterday. Sure. What would you have done differently? Very hard question. Here was my answer. When two packets arrived on the ether at the same time, I call that a collision. And that was a mistake. So what I would have done differently is called it something else, like, like multiplexing enforcement event. Because the word collision connotes Cars crashing, blood, screeches, sirens, and stuff. So when we were arguing for Ethernet, people were affected by the word collision. So I would have chosen a different word for that. That's my answer to the question what you would do. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.